Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Mary Ellen LeMay from the Aspetuck Land Trust. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn uh, for today. Um, we've got a really special program today and I'll be starting in a couple of minutes. We're letting people, uh, participants are em entering the room right now. So um, I'll welcome you all in a couple of minutes. So make sure you have your lunch and your soup warmed up and uh, we'll be starting shortly. I have some nice invasive plants to munch on during the webinar. <laughs> <Garlic> mustard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little hairy bitter crust. <laughs> If we can get our groundhogs to uh, enjoy it, I'll be all set. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we still have a lot of people coming in. Uh, give it probably right. five minutes. Mm -hmm. So before I welcome you and introduce our guests, uh, this is uh, the first time we're actually doing a panel uh, discussion for our Lunch and Learns. And uh, this was a really popular sign up, which means uh, a few things uh, that people are very concerned about um, invasives that they might be seeing on their property. Um, and with the great group of experts we have who have been dealing with invasives for years. I think we'll probably get some really nice pearls of wisdom today from, from our group um, as we uh, uh, talk. We're going to have um, <clears throat> the, the, the process will be the panel, panelists will um, each get an opportunity to introduce themselves and then um, they'll be asked questions by Emmett Vericchio, um, who's from the Connecticut invasive plant working group. And um, they'll each get to share their experiences and then you'll have an opportunity to, um, to ask your own questions. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do right now, it's 12.03 and as people are coming in, I think this is a good time for introductions. Um, so again, I'm Mary Ellen LeMay from the Aspetuck Land Trust. I'm the Director of Landowner Engagement and um, my job is to uh, provide inspiration and learning and action steps for people to transform their backyards into a more biodiverse uh, landscape. And one of the most important things before you start planting natives uh, is to remove the invasives on your property. So um, the, the um, topic we're gonna be discussing today um, is something that uh, we hadn't dealt with uh, so far in landowner engagement. So this is kind of a new journey for us. And it was brought to my attention by Ted uh, Luxinger, who works for the Fairfield Forestry Committee um, and is also the co-director of the Fairfield Pollinator Pathway. Um, uh, Ted has a passion for uh, invasives and, and getting them <laughs> not only out of yards, but out of large uh, properties um, with the forestry committee. Um, so Ted's career encompassed solution development and marketing in the technological field, uh, focused on financial services clients. And so uh, this is another example of a <clears throat> learn, earn, return uh, leader in our community, like we had last week with Charlie Stebbins, uh, and like we have with uh, a lot of folks. Um, they have their education part of their life, then their learning, uh, their uh, um, past learning, then they go into earning and uh, their careers, and now they take all the expertise and return it to the community. And that's where we are right now with. Um, with Ted. So uh, Ted asked if we could do something like this, a panelist, um, a group of panelists. And um, I said, sure, that's a great idea. And it's obviously we hit uh, um, a point that people were super interested in this. So I'd like to uh, introduce Ted Luxinger from Fairfield, let him launch us off and then give a little um, 
uh, information about how you should ask questions and participate in this uh, panel discussion. So uh, I leave it off to, uh, to Ted. And thank you again to Shana Meyer, who's our data manager at Aspetuck Land Trust, um, who's going to be managing all the uh, technology from behind the scenes. So thanks for joining today, everybody. And without further ado, here's Ted. All right, thanks so much, Mary Ellen. I really appreciated the uh, introduction. I have to say working with this expert panel has been a real pleasure and uh, very enlightening for me personally. Uh, we're all very excited since this is a pilot collaboration uh, amongst our content partners and represents both nonprofit and commercial participants. So if you have a private property and you've got invasives in the woods behind your property, we've got some folks that would be more than happy to help mitigate that damage. Um, that's potentially done by invasives. You know, a little concerned when Mary says that I'm uh, I'm obsessed with invasives. I'm not quite sure what that means about me, but uh, in any case, uh, I wanted to provide a sincere thank you to the Fairfield Pollinator Pathway. So I'm thanking myself uh, and Mary Hogue and Amanda Gracia, who are the other uh, co-directors of uh, the Pollinator Pathway, Aspetuck Land Trust, obviously. Um, hosting the Zoom and the registrations and the platform and the expertise on the panel, uh, the Connecticut Audubon Society for the expertise they've provided with Stefan, uh, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group for Emmett, um, and Mo Green, Dan Deventhal, uh, Dan Quixote, who's been uh, uh, mean green and uh, no gasoline for uh, over 10 years, uh, at, well, probably more like 15, but I won't go into that. Um, Kimote, I'd, also like Kimote. Thank, <laughs> I'd also like to thank all the interested organizations who joined us in promoting today's event. Uh, so we had a lot of support from other organizations that care about the same thing that we do. The objectives of today's webinar and Invasive Walk are to educate, help everyone understand the scope of the threat posed by invasive plants and species, both on our open spaces and in our own backyards. We need to be able to understand what's actually out there in the back of the house, um, and also to engage uh, more volunteers in managing our environments for everyone's benefit. Um, if you use it, support it uh, with the open spaces. Uh, we're going to follow up this webinar also with an invasive species walk that's going to be hosted by Stefan Martin at Lake Mohegan in Fairfield on the 9th of April, um, and that starts at 10 o'clock. So it's a, a leisurely stroll through uh, Lake Mohegan to see the things that you aren't aware are invasive. And the only thing I can warn you is once you see it, you can't unsee it. So be careful of that. <laughs> uh, and we've allowed, we've allowed a lot of time to answer your questions. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Emmett Verricchio, co-chair of the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group, who will provide some context and start the introductions of our expert panelists to get this show on the road. So thank you very much. Perfect, thank you so much, Ted, for that introduction. So I'm just gonna cover just a few slides right now, uh, hopefully not to overwhelm anyone, just for a couple minutes, and then I'm gonna introduce the panel and really get into this discussion, which is why we're here for today. So let me share my screen here. Perfect. Um, so why are we here today? Uh, we're here today to talk through about invasive plants. Um, so number one is what is an invasive plant? So there's a lot of jargon on this slide. And I think a lot of people are sometimes wonder what is really an invasive plant? Um, you may see something, what you think is invasive was not, you may see, see something that's just encroaching on your property. So I decided to just pull up kind of what the uh, Connecticut General Statute says about invasive plants. And there's nine um, criteria here, what plants need to meet in order to be invasive. Um, so I'm just gonna break this down for everyone. This is a lot of complicated information, but this is kind of what the law says. So it's always good to start, start high level and just break it down. Okay, so breaking this down, um, first, non-Indigenous. So the plant is not native to Connecticut. Um, some folks might think, oh, uh, is poison ivy an invasive plant? It is not, it is actually a native plant. Um, it may be considered invasive to some of you, but kind of in, in the realm of things, is really not an invasive plant here. Uh, two, the plant has to become naturalized. So it has to be able to um, go into an area where it normally wouldn't be found and really start um, repro reproducing itself and spreading. And it's important to know here that it also says without the aid and benefit of cultivation. 
So I have a picture here of bananas. Now you may be wondering, well, why would bananas be invasive? Well, they actually would never be invasive in Connecticut because you can plant a banana tree, it'll live, the frost will kill it. It can't reproduce. It can't um, get tall enough in order to produce seeds. So something like that, where it needs cultivation in order to plant it, in order for seeds to become uh, fertile, to grow, and also produce the next generation. Also, rapid and widespread dispersion. So not just um, encroaching on one little area, but really widespread, these, these plants be able to spread over the Connecticut landscape. Also ex um, going into more excessive dispersion as well. Um, also after current high numbers and outside of intensely managed areas. So right here, we're not talking necessarily about like lawns. So lawns are managed. There are invasive species, invasive plants that do occur in lawns. But if you're just going in your lawn and say, oh, whatever I planted is now going into my, into my grass, that's not necessarily considered an invasive plant. Has to meet all these criteria here. Uh, occurs well, widely with many populations. That's also an important thing here. And then we get really into kind of what I consider some of the top um, reasons for being invasive plant. So it has to outcompete. What does that mean? It needs to, if this plant gets into the environment, it's going to outcompete native plants, meaning it's going to reproduce faster than them. The native plants won't be able to keep up, and pretty soon you're, the area could be covered in bases. And what do these plants have? Well, they have rapid growth, high seed production, and that ability to establish within those native plant communities. So I just thought this would be helpful, just kind of break it down for anyone on the line who may not be as familiar with invasive plants here, kind of breaking down what all this jargon means for everyone here. Okay, so state of Connecticut. Um, what do we have uh, for invasive plants? We have 96 plants, um, the Connecticut invasive plant list. Uh, these are invasive uh, by that Connecticut statue I just showed everyone. And there's a lot of different plants in here. I'm not gonna go into nearly all of them. And I don't think none of us on the panel will either. But I wanted to provide this map of um, state of Connecticut here with the different towns highlighted. One of the invasive plants we have in Connecticut is mile a minute vine. I'm sure some of you are familiar. Um, a lot of folks here are joining from Fairfield County. Um, and I just wanna kind of play this, this uh, time-lapse video of how mile a minute has spread. So starting in 2000 and going all the way to present. One thing I'll note is what, what, did, what did everyone notice? It started in Fairfield County and worked its way north. Um, it worked its way north and east uh, primarily. We had some pockets pop up in different areas, but one of the things I like to mention is you living in Fairfield County, you have a lot of the newer type invasive plants, ones what we, like me, I live in uh, East Hampton, Connecticut, might not be as familiar with, just because of the way naturally how uh, plants uh, travel along the state of Connecticut. Here's just a photo of just some plants that you may be noticing right now. So in the upper left corner, we have barberry. So if you look in the woods and you see something green right about now, like kind of emerging, um, it's like bush-like, it's probably barberry. So leaves flush out really early. Um, and that's kind of what we see with invasive plants because they're not necessarily accustomed to our environment. These plants have come from sometimes uh, Japan or, or Asia or other parts of the world. So our climate is not necessarily the same as they're used to. So they start producing before our natives do. So you see barberry here, in a few, in a few weeks, it'll look like this, the bottom left um, plant right here will start flowering. In the middle, we have multiflora rose. That's another invasive that you'll be noticing now. It leaves out really early. To the right, um, this plant does leaf out a little bit later. It's winged eunonymus, um, also known as burning bush, but it's, I like including it here just because of how unique um, this is. Uh, you can see these wings, as, as they call them, coming out of the plant. So that's another invasive you can notice about this time of year. And then the, the bottom right right here is uh, garlic mustard. Um, so garlic mustard goes through kind of a two-year two process. So the plants right now are kind of looking like this. Pretty soon they'll start producing uh, seed heads. So keep a lookout just for these invasives uh, kind of in your area. Just really quick, I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but we're going to be discussing uh, management strategies for invasive plants. So here are some of the common strategies. There's mechanical, there's chemical. Um, the important thing to note is all these strategies can work in different ways. So certain invasive plants, um, react better to maybe pulling 
Um, but if you go out, you can't really pull a tree down, for example. So you have to kind of say, what's the lifestyle of the plant? Um, what, when is it flowering? That's always important to kind of manage it before it flowers. But here are just some of the common ways, both mechanical and chemical strategies here. One of the things I had the uh, privilege of developing a few years back was this uh, management invasive ca uh, calendar right here. And we did the top 10 plants of concern as identified uh, from attendees of our Sipwig Symposium. And it just goes into common ways you can manage some of these plants. So this is going to be available in the resources tab provided to the attendees here today. Perfect. Now that I kind of gave everyone just a quick walkthrough of some of the topics we'll be talking through, I'm really excited to um, stop sharing my screen and really opening up to the rest of the, the panel here. So uh, we can start with some introductions. So um, maybe Lou, do you want to start with some introductions, kind of what you do, um, and maybe even in a common invasive plant you work with? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Emmett. Um, I'm Lou Bakioki. For those of you who haven't met me, um, I've been working with the Aspetuck Land Trust for the past 37 years managing their open spaces. Uh, previous to that, I was director of sanctuaries from uh, the Connecticut Audubon Society. So uh, I've been in this area working with uh, most of these people one way or another for a long time now. And, um, and I have been working with these invasive plants for a good, a good portion of that. Uh, one of my duties uh, when I was at Audubon and I continue to do it now is to manage the uh, Smith Richardson tree farm for the, uh, at the Connecticut Audubon property in Westport. And I kind of cut my teeth dealing with barberry that, you know, continued to spread and grow up all the Christmas trees and things. So that's where we got started. And it's just over the years, more and more of an issue uh, dealing with these various uh, plants. Some people say, well, why do you care? Or why do you even worry about invasive plants? And it's because we really want to sort of build, uh, you know, one, we want to take good care of the properties, we want to be good stewards of the land, which means we want to be able to use the property as humans and yet still provide good habitat for the wildlife and, uh, and build resilience. That's, that to me is the biggest key is building resilience. And by resilience, I mean the ability um, of, of a property or of an area to uh, absorb the effects of some sort of a difficulty, some sort of a, uh, an event, um, whether it be you know, a big storm event, whether it be the ash dieback from all the, you know, the ash borer, or whether it be you know, climate change in the future. Uh, the more resilience, the more diversity you have, the better that property is going to be able to sort of stay tough and provide the habitat that we need uh, for the wildlife and for our own use. Um, um, and so that's you know, basically my introduction to it. Uh, I've been dealing with various issues of uh, barberry, uh, wisteria, winged euonymus, multiflora rose, all the, all the usual suspects, so to speak. But um, you know, I've been sort of attacking the, the biggest and worst areas first. So um, that's been our focus up front. And uh, we're making a commitment to really try and get everything under control. And, in our Trout Brook Valley Preserve at first, and then extending to our other properties where we have, you know, a little over 2,000 acres we're currently managing. So, that's great. No, thank you so much, Lou, for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna move on to Stefan. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself and kind of uh, what invasives are you seeing in your uh, the lands you manage. Great, thank you, Emmett. Uh, my name is Stefan Martin. I'm the habitat steward for the Connecticut Audubon Society. Um, so essentially, I have the position that Lou used to have once upon a time. Um, so that, that uh, goes with managing our properties uh, for invasive plants, um, any large scale habitat restoration or habitat enhancement projects. So um, with, taking uh, with taking the invasives out, we need to then plant with something. So um, planting natives on our property as well. Um, do habitat surveys, plant surveys, bird surveys, um, all that fun stuff. So the outdoors is my office, uh, which I can't complain about. Uh, we manage uh, a little over 3,400 acres in the state, um, so certainly have our, um, our work cut out for us. Um, I uh, specifically work on a handful of properties um, in Fairfield County, um, including Sherman, which is kind of the furthest north you can get in Fairfield County. So 
sometimes our uh, invasives that we have up there might be a little bit different than what we have along the coastline here in Fairfield County. Uh, some of the big ones, and this goes across the board for all of our properties, are going to be bittersweet, oriental bittersweet. Um, I really like to um, manage the, the vines. So something that we don't have yet, thankfully, uh, knock on wood, uh, in the far northern portions of Fairfield County, or at least to a point where there's large uh, scale infestations, are things like myelominate or porcelainberry, which we certainly have a lot of down here in lower Fairfield County. Um, those are kind of the, the big, big ones that I'd like to focus on. Um, if we get an infestation of those plants, it's essentially going to kind of ruin our whole habitat structure. Uh, if those go unchecked and unmanaged, it's gonna take down all of our native shrubs, all of our native trees, um, and just create a, an absolute mess and just a tangle. I don't know if uh, folks were on the, um, the uh, Lunch and Learn with Charlie Stevens talking about the Smith Richardson property, um, but that was just, yeah, I always like to use the example um, if you've ever seen The Lion King um, and he's showing, you know, Simba what their land is and what their land is not, um, and the land that's dark and overrun and just bones, that's kind of what Smith Richardson looked like. Um, so we, uh, we went in there with, with grant funding and, um, and donor funding and we're able to actually manage all that and, and return it to a really beautiful uh, native uh, landscape. Um, some of the other things that we focus on um, as far as plants go on our properties, and again, this is kind of uh, across the board, are um, barberry, Japanese barberry, and winged euonymus. Um, so those are some of the big heavy hitters that we're trying to deal with right now. Perfect. No, thank you so much for that. And I think we're hearing kind of a little bit of theme so far. There's a lot of invasive plants um, and uh, there's a lot to do in, in, in Fairfield County and across the state of Connecticut. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Dan, do you want to do an introduction and in kind of what plants you're seeing? Thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Delventhal, AKA Don Kimote, Mon of La Mogreen. And now I'll sing the impossible dream. No, uh, I'll spare you. <laughs> but uh, Mo Green is clean and serene, no gasoline. It's a company we started 16 years ago uh, because I've always been disturbed uh, by lawn care. <laughs> and the, uh, I looked at it as like a crazy practice, all the uh, noise and, and, uh, and pollution. I thought it was a pretty serious uh, gas consumption issue, but once I got into it a little bit as a hobby with push mowers and brooms and rakes, I realized this is a big pollution problem. 10% of our air pollution comes from these small engines, not to mention the noise, which everybody's going crazy about in the pandemic, trying to work from home with the low frequency gas leaf blower um, <clears throat> sound, dis disrupting cognition, raising blood pressure, creating tinnitus uh, and all that. So uh, I started Mo Green to, um, I, I continued to build it, to address the air pollution problem. And then as, as I went along, I realized, man, there's a lot of problems here in lawn care, the toxins, the chemicals. So we aspired to be uh, organic providers where uh, treatments make sense. And, uh, and then it, I found out I couldn't offer to spray things like vinegar or garlic oil without a really difficult license through the state of Connecticut. So I embarked on that journey. After failing a written exam a couple of times and an oral exam once, I managed to get that license, pass that test. And that's why I'm a, a Connecticut uh, 3A category pesticide supervisor. I never thought that would, I'd have a title like that. <clears throat> I did get the AOLCP because I want to learn how to do organic treatments. Now enter the third uh, issue that I didn't even see coming. And it's probably started only four or five years ago when I we learn a lot from our customers too, uh, because they're the most environmentally conscious people around. So I started to learn about invasives, and one of the one of the big uh, moments was a, uh, a, a Doug tallamy has been on the lecture circuit, uh, the Pollinator Pathway, and, and Darien at the time, two or three years ago, had him speak. So normally after uh, after I hear somebody speak, I want to synthesize what did what did all that mean? Well, here's what it meant to me: if we don't <clears throat> convince private property owners to maintain 70% uh, native plants and, 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 and homeowners to stop using chemicals and, and, and of course, stop losing our wetlands. 
um, we're all going to die. <laughs> so uh, this is an important topic because we're talking about protecting the food web that starts at the insects and the birds. And let me tell you about the birds and the bees and the leaves we ought to leave and the pollinator pathway and the green corridor and this event. So uh, I'm really happy to be uh, providing services, helping people identify invasives. What am I seeing on lawns? <clears throat> because I kind of represent, you know, the, the homeowner lawn uh, perspective here in this session. There's, uh, there's two plants, it, you know, people, it, we believe in lawn reduction. So people are doing meadows, reducing lawns. And that's a great thing because lawns are not good for the environment. Water runs right off them. And, and uh, so that's a problem. The water basin, people call it green pavement. So what am I seeing? If you want grass, <clears throat> a majority of grass, and many people do, it's a matter of style, but diversity is better with native plants. You, you've got to prevent invasive, pervasive plants uh, from weaving their way into that lawn and taking over, snuffing out the grass that you'd like to see. And two plants that we, uh, we're seeing all the time are Indian mock strawberry and creeping Charlie, also known as uh, ground ivy. So those two plants just, they're, they, they're not native, they don't belong here, they're invasive, and they, uh, they just spread like crazy. You, you blink uh, two or three weeks later, you've got uh, you know from a two foot section to a 20 foot section. So we try to tell our workers, hey, if you see this plant, you have no idea how hard it is to get rid of. Even if you're using, even the chemical advocates will tell you use this chemical and support it with hand weeding. Then come back three weeks later, do it again and do more hand weeding. So <clears throat> chemicals are not a panacea or panacea. Uh, so that's- uh, oh, I, I, and, I, and I think Dan, we, we, we hear that a lot. It's like homeowners may not know what they have until someone points it out. Um, and, and kind of giving your background, I think is very helpful for everyone um, as well. Coming from, uh, I know we have a couple of land stewards on the line and stuff like that, but thank you so much. Um, so just moving on, just just really quick. So we kind of talked about kind of what what we do, um, and we kind of talked mentioned a few invasive plants here and a little bit about control. But when you when you go to your property, like where do you start? I mean, like I think that's where a lot of us struggle. It's like you just look out and you see invasive plants everywhere. It's like where do you start? Um, maybe uh, uh, Stefan, do you want to start? Sure. <clears throat> um... Yeah, so uh, try not to get overwhelmed with everything. Once you start to, to, to know what, you know, how to identify certain plants, uh, a lot of folks will look outside and see green. Green is good. Um, I know a lot of the invasive plants that we have around here. Um, my girlfriend and I go for a walk and she points out an area and said, look how beautiful it is. Look up. Actually, it's not that beautiful because 90% of it's invasive plants. Um, so uh, I've been trying to to maybe not mention that as much so that we can just have a nice walk in the woods one of these days, but um, try not to get overwhelmed. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that I've, I have found personally and I've struggled with. Um, some of our properties are, are big properties. We have these large stands of invasive plants. Um, so start to identify these areas that are manageable, um, things that are, you know, you can, you can see a, a, a tangible change or difference in something where um, you don't have to be out there eight hours a day, every single day, um, you know, start small, start to be able to identify um, these plants. That's really where to start. How do you identify the plants, which is why we're having one of those walks on April 9th at Lake Mohegan um, and early detection, rapid response. That I mean, once you identify these plants, you're able to then see them in their, their young form um, so that it's easier to manage, but definitely don't get overwhelmed. Where do you start right now, right here? Um, you know, joining these Zooms, joining um, volunteer groups, uh, going out and learning about um, and identifying invasive plants and, and just helping out. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, different resources out there. Um, let, um, you know, take a look at our, our calendar for, um, you know, even bird walks. Um, we, we, have a lot of invasive plant talk on our bird walks, just really education. But yeah, don't get overwhelmed. Uh, it, you know, we can do this and everybody together, we can do this for sure. Great. Um, so, so Dan, if a homeowner calls you, calls you up and uh, wants you to come out, look at all, like, where do you start? Like, how do you assess uh, what like invasives are around and um, where do you go from there? 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll do a little walkthrough and, and look at what's in the turf and uh, consider um, you know, strategies to uh, take care of it and, and on the periphery because it's kind of a different plant set. Uh, recently, I've become more sensitive to the water uh, issues. And so it's funny, earlier I would you know, walk around and I'd think about what kind of uh, physical, mechanical methods might be required, cultural, you know, uh, IPM is uh, an acronym for really good uh, stewardship through uh, keeping the plants you want healthy so that they're resistant to uh, problems. So, you know, so we talk about, you know, proper care and all that and, and what the strategies would be for removal. But for a while, I was going around without really being sensitive to moisture. And uh, I've got a, a mentor, Mike Papa, he's a great guy. And he talks about, you got to balance the water, the carbon, the nitrogen, you got to develop the ecosystem, you got to get the biology right. So I wasn't looking at the water and, and it's amazing. Uh, and they do say this, you know, but I, I think it kind of fell, you know, went, uh, I missed it maybe the first time or two, but water is the biggest issue when it comes to uh, lawns or, or gardens. So I, I really look at the water. Is there water coming off of that house? Is there water flowing over that patio? Uh, and, and so you can come up with some strategies uh, with berms uh, to, to divert the water or um, extra soil or French drains or trenches, uh, dry wells, things like that. It's really important to figure out why is this thing being washed with water constantly? Uh, or or is, it, uh, is there any oxygen in the soil at all? What can grow there? Certainly not grass. No, so, no, for sure. And, and I mean, that's, that's so important. You, you see that not just in lawns, but like in the environment, like when you have an area, what are the sensitive areas? Like, where do you wanna focus your time? Uh, so I think identifying that that is just so helpful when you start, when you start out. And last but not least, Lou, where do you start managing it? You know, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of acres, a lot of trails. How do you uh, kind of assess uh, the landscape there? Yeah, well, we usually, you know, on our larger properties, we're taking a look at you know, pretty large areas. Um, and sometimes you just have to, you know, walk the area, identify what you have. As a homeowner, you're going to be looking at a much smaller area usually. You know, look at the size of your property. What are your goals for the property? Um, are you going to do the work yourself? Are you going to hire out? Um, and that may make a difference. What is your availability of labor? Uh, what is your tolerance for spraying? You know, um, I've concentrated on the major infestations first. And I mean, I've gone to areas where we had four acres of basically a barb, uh, a, um, a wisteria understory that was six to eight feet tall and everything else was just mangled trees that were mangled by wisteria vines going up, girdling the trees or, or breaking big hunks of them down. And, and frankly, the first time I looked at it, I was, you know, I went up there with our executive director, David, and he asked me, you think you can do this? And I looked at it and I go, I really don't know. I, I never saw anything as bad as that. Um, but you just start at the beginning. You, you, you kind of formulate a plan and you start working your plan. And, and basically we, you know, in a situation like that, we had a spray. So we sprayed the, uh, the major parts of it. And now we continue to go back and mop up little bits of things that are coming up. But, uh, you know, it's a process. It's not a, you know, you don't just say, I'm just going to erase this. It's, you know, yeah. you have to sort of become in touch with your property and, uh, and make sure that you have a plan to sort of recolonize the area as well. And I think we'll, probably talk more about that in, the, in a little bit later, but, uh, you know, planting the natives and stuff in afterwards is, is a big, is a big piece of it because the natives are going to support the native insects, which support the whole food web. So, um, uh, and I think I saw a question coming in about, you know, how about the, the new wild and keeping some of these invasives as the only problem with some of these invasives is they really don't support our native insect populations that were, are so important to the rest of the whole system. So that's where we go with that. No, no thank I, I you have for a quick, that. Quick yeah, addition to that um, about <clears throat> the keeping some of the natives thing. That's all, that, it's, a, it's a balance, especially with our properties. Um, you know, observation is really important with that. Um, even though they are in, invasive, there are areas that wildlife are still using. 
um, if you have these big established plots, let's say of um, barberry um, or multiflora rose, you know, that is important cover habitat. That is, that is important wintering habitat um, for New England cottontails. Um, hooded warbler, uh, I'll, I'll, you're hard pressed to find a hooded warbler that's not gonna be utilizing um, those patches to breed right now. Uh, if you don't have a plan to replace um, that habitat type, um, then it's, in, in my opinion, almost more beneficial to leave some of that as cover habitat, um, unless, again, you have a plan to replace uh, with, with native plants. Um, but observation, that's a really important thing, too, is if you're looking on your property, where, where is the wildlife going? Where am I seeing most, most of these birds? <clears throat> and winter is an important time. Um, so you, you might be able to remove uh, the barberry and, and make brush piles, uh, for instance, as a temporary, um, you know, cover habitat for them. Yeah. So it's, you know, observation um, is, is very important as well. You know, what, what is you utilizing what and when? Um, and Definitely. then developing, uh, developing a plan to then um, appropriately put back that habitat type. No, for sure. I mean, like, I don't think, uh, I don't think anyone uh, in the panel at least has access to millions of dollars and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and Dan I know you you don't have uh, thousands of people working for you as well and if anyone on the line has access to millions of dollars I think there's some people who who can do some really good work with uh, managing invasive plants so how, how do you how do you like manage invasive plants when you have to I know we talked about kind of focusing your efforts on areas that that may be of uh, more concern within within a property um, but how do you manage like the the invasive plants and how do you, is there a specific example of what worked well for you? Um, maybe we'll start with Dan first. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I've got a couple uh, case uh, scenarios that were, were really cool. One was a back bank behind a house, uh, not really that critical, but the, the homeowners were looking at it a lot and they just thought it looked so uh, messy and, and obnoxious and overgrown. And so they started talking and, the, and some of the roots had become a little bit bare. Maybe they had the heavy gas leaf blowers stripping topsoil over the years, um, <clears throat> thinking that it was a good thing to strip all the leaves. Not, uh, so they, uh, they, they talked about getting a proposal for a big project to strip everything out and to bring in some soil or compost or mulch to uh, build up that layer, uh, protect the roots a little bit, and then put some native plants in there. And uh, it, it was a pretty big number. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of proposals were generated, a lot of talk, but then uh, it, uh, it wasn't important enough to spend that kind of money on it. But what was done, and uh, we partner with a number of professionals, Michelle Sorensen is one of them, I give her a little shout out. And uh, so she helped mm -hmm. identify uh, invasive plants and, and, and doing some selective weeding, some winged euonymus, some wineberry, uh, maybe some bittersweet. But so it, it was called out a little bit and, and thinned down. And then uh, just uh, other plants started emerging. Yep. Uh, false Solomon seal, nice native uh, flower and uh, wood aster, white wood aster. And it, it looked beautiful in the fall. And it, it just, I got such a big kick out of it because we, you know, we generated uh, high dollar proposals to do things back there. We did nothing but pull some invasives out and we allowed that native seed bank to come around. Second that's grade an, That's an ideal situation right there, Dan. Just, uh, and and I, that can work in, in, in areas. I mean, like a lot of us don't realize like, hey, if, if, if you have the manpower, if, if you can just, if their bases are easy to pull, pull them up. I mean, that works wonders in certain areas. And there's usually a seed bank underneath, as you mentioned, and natives can come in. Uh, we'll get into the, uh, how, what do we do after managing, but I think that's, that'll be something we'll touch upon again. Um, uh, Stefan, like, so what about you? Is there a specific example of maybe a property where, where you're overwhelmed by invasives and what worked well for you kind of managing them? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, utilizing volunteers. Um, and, and we that's one thing that we, we really count on is, um, you know, we're, we're a couple people strong in our sanctuary um, department here. Uh, so we really utilize volunteers. And we try to do mechanical or physical work as much as possible, limiting our use of herbicides though, uh, for a from a management perspective. 
they are a tool um, and they, they can be used appropriately. Obviously, again, we try to limit as much as possible um, to physical and mechanical. Um, certain tools like weed wrenches um, or, you know, um, extractigators, they're called, um, <laughs> where you, you, that you use leverage to actually pull out um, shrubs like, um, you know, barberry or small burning bushes. Um, and then we then move them to a brush pile and allow for, uh, you know, the, the native seed bank to then uh, hopefully, ideally, native seed bank to then regenerate afterwards um, or, you know, next question, but we'll replant with natives at that case. But so we've had a lot of su success doing that. Um, you know, I'll touch a little bit on, on chemical application. Um, woody plants, um, larger woody plants, large mature burning bush, so winged euonymus, um, or uh, even some of these woody vines like established porcelain berry or established um, bittersweet, uh, Atlantis shoots, um, you know, any woody plant really, um, you can you can cut and then you can treat. Um, I have this little handy, oh, it's invisible, um, but it's a, uh, there it is. Oh, uh, I know that, yep. It's, it's called a buckthorn blaster. Buckthorn blaster, yep. Um, and it essentially is this modified bingo dotter um, that you then fill with herbicide and you can fill with a marker dye, like we have the blue in here to know which stems that we've painted if we're cutting a lot of stems at once. Um, and then surfactant. Um, so surfactant kind of reduces the surface tension um, and helps it draw into the plant a little bit better. Um, we have had really great success uh, on, on specifically timing our applications on some of these woody materials. Yep. Um, Milford Point, uh, the Coastal Center at Milford Point is a property that we manage. Um, and we have a lot of Atlantis on that property and a lot of uh, young shoots uh, of Atlantis. So if you cut a tree, some like like an Atlantis, um, let's use that as an example. If you cut a tree down and you don't either stump grind it or you know pull out the the roots, it's going to send a lot of young shoots out. So yep. one plant can turn into twenty or fifty plants. Um, so we we over the past years, trees have come down that weren't treated like this. So we've had a fifty to one hundred to one hundred fifty, like a lot of these young shoots cut and paint, and that's that's that. Um, so yeah, great success. Know using that appropriately that that i mean i i do the same thing um we had a, a field uh when i was living with my mother a few years ago and i would go out there there's trees in the field and cutting and painting those invasive trees it works really well something uh something simple um lou what about you any uh success stories you could point to with managing invasive plants yeah we've done several in the forest areas one of our i think one of our best examples of, uh, of, a, of a success story is our Taylortown salt marsh where we had uh, you know a whole area just solid Phragmites uh, with basically nothing but the Phragmites in there and uh, we worked with the state a little bit on that and um, uh, it was a matter of going in and uh, mowing it down and then uh, they did spray it for a couple of years and then we've gone in and kind of mopped up afterwards. Uh, but the seed bank in there is amazing. And in two years, it's turned into a beautiful salt marsh community with cattails coming back, all kinds of salt marsh plants and shrubs. I mean, it's just, I almost didn't believe how much diversity was in there. And I went in there and the, uh, I think it was around May. Uh, it's just shrubs were in flower like crazy. The area was just covered with bees that I had never seen there before. So. Uh, that was a tremendous success story. And, and again, just getting rid of the invasives there and the native seed bank took over and repopulated in an amazing way. Um, you know, we've done some other forest cuts where we, you know, had either barberry infestations or the wisteria. And then we combined uh, the control of the invasives with some patch cuts and some thinnings in the forest, got more light to it and converted those into early successional habitats. And uh, I've walked those areas with the state foresters and the state biologists, and they're very impressed, and I am too, with, uh, th with the diversity of both trees and sort of native stuff coming up. I'm not going to say we don't have, you know, a bunch of stilt grass in there and some garlic mustard coming up and what was a previous woodland, but um, the trade-off has been really good as far as seeing, um, you know, the young trees coming up and actually having an understory again, because uh, previously, it was mature trees and barberry understory for nine acres, and uh, yep. that's changed drastically. So, 
That's great. That, that's really great. And and what and listening to everyone's uh, stories, you didn't use the same control technique. I think that's important for the audience to know. It's like there's many ways to do it. You can go mechanical. You you can use herbicides um, depending on your comfort level. Um, there's many ways to manage invasive plants and it all depends what plant you're managing, what time of year it is, what your budget is. There's a lot of different factors and and we can kind of get into specifics on certain plants in a minute and there's a lot of resources out there. I know on the SIPWIG website we provide different control methods as well. Um, but just moving on. So talk about managing vases a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people alluded to, I know Stefan, you alluded to this, so maybe I'll start with you. Um, what do you do after you manage and the importance of maybe planting natives if the natives aren't, don't really come back and the importance of making sure that you actually have something there after you remove the uh, invasives so the invasives just don't come back as well? Yeah, sure. Um, that's a very important topic. Um, and it's, it's, it's sometimes it depends on, on which natives or excuse me, which invasive that you are going to be removing. You know, if you're going to be focusing predominantly on things like what we hadn't talked about yet, like mugwort and stuff like that. Um, oh, yeah. You're really going to have to manage that for a, a few different years, depending on your management technique before I would feel comfortable replanting. If you want to replant a meadow, let's say um, with other forbs, um, that would be a little difficult to do. Um, so there's certain instances where I, I would say if it's you know a small enough patch where you're able to continuously monitor without planting, um, then that would be okay. But these larger stands of, um, you know, for one instance, uh, I'll give an example. We removed a fairly decently sized um, um, barberry patch, and uh, we didn't have the funds at the time or the resources to replant it with that specific habitat type. Though there were other stands around it. So we utilized those existing stands as that cover habitat um, that we removed and then also created brush, brush piles and then spread some, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be seeing the regeneration of the shrubs there. So we put in, um, you know, snake root, um, which is a nice uh, native forb uh, that, that can tolerate a lot of shade or sun. Um, and the next year we had tons of pollinators in that area. So we were actually incorporating a different habitat type within that um, that was benefiting um, you know, the, uh, the pollinators as well. <clears throat> um, we really, if you don't have a, a decent plan, so planning is important too. If you don't have a decent plan to do anything within that space that you remove these invasives from or follow up, um, it's most likely going to revert back to invasives at some point. Um, so we try to remove certain shrubs and replant with certain shrubs like dogwoods, viburnums, um, um, spice bushes, witch hazels, you know, all, all depending on the conditions at the time. But definitely try to get your hands on some native plants um, and, and replant with natives. But again, be careful of, um, you know, what you're removing and what you want to do with that space. Um, again, you know, something like mugwort. Um, you're going to really want to monitor that spot for a couple seasons at least before you you want to go back in there with um, with some additional grasses or forbs. For sure, yeah, and it's not a one and done process usually ever. There's, you're never going to get everything. There's going to be a seed bank in a lot of these locations, so there's always going to be some invasives. What'll be cropping yeah. up? But monitoring is very very important after the fact, definitely, um, because you know we will have that. Hopefully, we'll ideally we'll have a native seed bank as well. But uh, you yep. still will get some invasive pop up. Um, and that's the time that you want to manage them. Ideally, when they're young, when they're easy to pull up by hand, you don't have to use herbicide, you don't have to use um, you know, machinery at all. Um, yep. So definitely monitor um, after the fact and you know, replant with natives when you can and, and specifically try to pick uh, plants that are going to be you know, host species for um, our native insects. For sure. um, so dogwoods are great, viburnums are awesome. Um, and we'll, we'll include a plant list uh, as well in the, the resource yep. for everybody. Definitely. What about you, Lou? What do you uh, do after you made this invasives? Any uh, natives you end up planting? What's your process? Uh, part of our process is planting things that we know will be successful. Um, and, uh, and I think important in this discussion is talking about everybody wants to plant native plants. Um, but in our area, we have a big deer problem. And if you just go in and plant $2,000 worth of native plant, <laughs> You could have just planted a $2,000 winter salad for the deer population in your area, and you can come back in the spring and have nothing left. So uh, 
any, any planting plan really needs to include protecting those plants till they can get to the point where they can tolerate some browsing. Um, trees usually have to have something around the bark just to protect bucks from rubbing on them. Uh, we planted three trees in our Haskins lawn last year. We had a, a landscaper decide they were gonna donate them and come and plant them for us. I marked the locations. They planted them one afternoon. I had my guys come out the next morning to put some protection around them and they'd already rubbed the bark off the half of the trees. So it was amazing. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you can fence off certain areas, uh, even shrubs, you know, when they get to a certain size can tolerate a decent amount of browsing. But if it's a small two or three foot shrub, they can, you know, deer can go in. I mean, they don't eat everything at once, but over the course of two or three months, they yep. will go in and take that back to the stem, you know, basically. So uh, you do need to keep that in mind. Uh, and there are certain plants, that they don't bother as much as others. You know, we've We've had good luck with a lot of the viburnums. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of different, uh, you know, there's a lot of different lists that tell you which things are resistant or not. Uh, some of it just depends on how, how hungry the deer in your area <laughs> are because they will eat things that are on the resistant yep. list uh, if that's all there is. So just be mindful of the fact that uh, you are investing a significant amount of money and time getting that stuff reestablished. You do need to consider how you're going to protect it, whether it's fencing or spraying with repellents or, you know, a whole, a whole lot of things like that are important to consider. For sure. There's definitely a lot of considerations when, when you consider um, what, like what type of uh, habitat you have, do you have a lot of deer around and, and, and so on. What about you, Dan? What do you do after you, uh, you help folks uh, remove their invasive plants? Well, it's uh, usually involves a little bit of homework, either on the homeowner's part or, or a landscape designer's part. A lot of people say, well, we do planting, we'll help you plant anything, but if you don't know what you want us to plant, then we need to engage uh, somebody for that homework to look at the uh, microclimate in that area and to look at what the objective is uh, in terms of uh, you know, understory or middle story or that kind of thing, and whether you wanna make it hospitable to birds, et cetera. Uh, so we, we often work with landscape designers. Uh, we have one or two that we, uh, that we like most. Uh, and, and we'll often, and, and like with this event, is supposed to give us some ideas. Uh, I learned something today, uh, chatting with Michelle. I mentioned uh, Michelle Sorensen earlier. But she, uh, she pointed out that the goldenrod and asters are uh, to um, wildflowers what oaks are to trees. And in that, they host about a hundred species. Uh, so they are so productive. And uh, it's, it's a shame too, because the uh, goldenrod has always been looked at often as a weed. So we, uh, you know, we love the resources that uh, are accumulated here today uh, so that people can use them in terms of alternatives to yep. invasive plants. And we would you know, uh, share those freely with, uh, with anyone we know and, and refer to them and then go to professionals as well uh, if it's a, a fairly complex situation. Definitely, no, and, and you mentioned goldenrod. Yeah, I, I, I love goldenrod. A lot of people confuse goldenrod with ragweed. Ragweed's the one that has allergens. Goldenrod's, their uh, pollen's too big, it doesn't go airborne. So you see goldenrod, don't, don't be uh, cutting it down, especially at the end of the year with all the different bees and stuff trying to collect pollen for the winter. And just touching Perfect. base on the, the deer momentarily. I, I often yep. found that if you pay for it, it tastes better to deer. So yeah, certainly you know, plan accordingly. <laughs> They know, they know. Perfect. Um, so I, I know we want to kind of get into kind of some some next steps, and then we definitely want to get into some questions. Um, so uh, just really quick, uh, any advice to get people involved? And then I know we have we definitely do have some uh, next steps that we want people to take. But um, Dan, any next steps? How people can get involved? Any opportunities for engagement um, uh, that you can think of? Well. Um... Yeah, just it's actually it's easy to to take a look at your uh, plants and uh, pick one that, that you're not sure of a plant that's out of place. A weed is defined as a plant that's out of place. So if you uh, if you see some plants that you don't expect to be where they are, take an app and uh, and 
and look up that plant. You can just take a picture and it'll tell you what it is. Often you can follow a link to Wikipedia and find out if it's a native or, or uh, and, and non-native, if it's invasive. Uh, so that's, that's one way to get involved uh, personally, locally. And then uh, of course, this event has an opportunity for uh, some free training with a little walkabout with Stefan yeah. coming up at Lake Mohegan. I think that's a, that's a fabulous opportunity. Yeah, and, Stephen, and you then, want to talk about that quick? Sure, oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, April 9th at Lake Mohegan, um, we'll be meeting in the parking area. Um, I don't believe there's any RSVP, so just please show up um, with, uh, I'm sure I'll point out some birds as well. So if you want to bring your binoculars or maybe a little, you know, loop magnifying glass um, would be great too. Uh, we're going to touch on some of the plants that we can expect to see at that time of year. Um, things that are going to be um, coming into uh, into leaf at that time, so like moldy floor rose, and there's going to be garlic mustard, plenty of garlic mustard, I'm sure, yeah. uh, barberry, <laughs> all that stuff. But basically, just showing you how to identify things um, and how you can then be a steward on your own land, um, and then how you can help um, uh, teach people how to identify these things. Um, and I'll be showing uh, folks some other uh, resources that you can use on your phone, like iNaturalist, and how yeah. or Seek. Um, how we can use that to identify certain things that we're unsure of. I use it often, um, or reporting certain things. Um, that's that goes a lot ways, a lot of long way as well. Um, so yeah, no, I look forward to uh, to meeting a lot of you in person on April 9th. Um, and I had a question about if dogs were welcome. Um, well, Lake Mohegan is the spot to bring your dog. So uh, as long I say yes, as long as we can train them to smell out invasives, then yes, we you can bring your dog. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Louis, any, any, any quick thoughts um, here? Well, uh, we at the Aspect Land Trust have a sort of invasive team that we've assembled and we get together monthly to do uh, a work day. Uh, we also do some special projects. So if you're interested in helping us out and we do provide training and, uh, and it's a great way if you want to do this on your own property to come and volunteer for a day or two and then kind of take that information home and apply it to your own properties. Uh, but aspetucklandtrust.org uh, and go to our you know volunteer opportunities uh, areas and and sign up. Uh, we're happy to have anybody that wants to come. Yeah, and then I'll mention for SIPWIG we do uh, educational uh, sessions such as this as well. So if you have uh, anything you need, just uh, send us an email info at SIPWIG uh, org. There you can send us the email there or go on our website. There's other ways to um, we do invasive walks as well. So just reach out to us and we can organize something. Perfect. Um, I know we want to save about a half an hour for questions if, if, if folks want to stay on uh, for the next half an hour or so. But before I do that, I'm going to hand it uh, back over to Ted just to talk through kind of a little bit what we just touched upon as well um, and a call to action. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, let me go to this slide here. Perfect. So this is answering, I think, a lot of the questions that have been asked online already. You know, how can you get involved? Um, learn to identify key invasive plants in open spaces and your yards. As has already been mentioned, training is available from our partners at Aspetuck Land Trust, Connecticut Audubon, and Sipuig. Download resources from the linked sign in your the, the linked site in your confirmation email. You can see the uh, the, the um, link right there on the screen, and that has a document in it that has native alternatives to invasive plants. Because I know a number of you had asked about, you know, I've got burning bush uh, in my you know in my garden. It's still sold by nurseries in Connecticut. It's still available via mail order. There are beautiful alternative natives. So you know you don't have to start with everything at once. You can start small if you've got one ornamental plant that's looking kind of sickly and needs to be replaced, look for a native to replace it with. You know, every little replacement of an ornamental with a native is improving the environment for the critters that we all want to survive um, and support the birds and the rest of the food web. Volunteer to help manage our open spaces. Um, the town of Fairfield, we're gonna be signing up volunteers uh, at Stephens Walk at Lake Mohegan for the Friends of Lake Mohegan. And I'm even proposing we set up a paw patrol of dog walkers to also start looking for uh, invasives and to get involved in helping to manage the open space. You know, we're blessed in our area with a lot of really great open spaces. 
And um, we have to get involved in helping to manage them together as a community on an ongoing basis, or they will be taken over by the invasives. If we don't, it's hard work. You know, if we don't do the work, it's not going to happen. And I've volunteered for Connecticut Audubon as well as Asperger Land Trust over the course of the last couple of weeks to do some invasive polls. It's actually fun. You know, it's great to get together with folks that are part of your tribe and uh, work together to do some good. It really is a, a wonderful experience. So I highly recommend you volunteer uh, for any of the organizations that provide training and also have pulls uh, organized on a regular basis. Uh, let's see, look for commercial sustainable invasive management companies if you're not into DIY. If you have invasives on your lawn, in your yard, uh, Dan and Mo Green is one. Um, there's another one, uh, Essex Horticultural uh, has signed on to help in managing invasives, as has Native uh, Nurseries. They've got a uh, landscaping business that will also manage uh, invasives. There's a document, uh, again, that was uh, in the link, the email link that uh, references our commercial partners. There are also five nurseries in town, you know, Oliver, Native, um, Outdoor Design and Living, Ganem, uh, Colonial Gardens have all agreed to make it easier for you to find native alternatives um, to the current uh, uh, ornamental plants that you might be looking to replace. So uh, please look, look that out. It's in the resource folder that was sent to everybody in the confirmation email. Uh, and finally, take the pollinator pathway pledge and get on the map, all right? Basically, you're pledging not to use pesticides. You're pledging to plant natives wherever you can. You're pledging to remove grass where it's not necessary, possibly turn it into a meadow, which I'm in the process of doing in my backyard right now. Um, and our map overlays the Aspatuck Land Trust map. Aspatuck is creating a corridor for uh, wildlife from the Long Island Sound all the way up to Massachusetts, um, which is awesome. They're, they're buying properties and managing those properties. If you overlay the private properties that are part of the pollinator pathway, on top of the Aspatuck corridor, we're building connectivity for wildlife, and that's and that's crucial um, for the maintenance of the food web. So, you know, these are ways that you guys can get involved. We've got tons of questions, so I'm going to shut up and go. Yeah, to, no, uh, no, no. Thank you, thank you, Ted. And yeah, I know, <laughs> nice I know some done. of you. <laughs> I know some of you had to drop for one, uh, but anyone who wants to stay on the line for the next half an hour, go try to go through your questions uh, at a brisk pace. We'll also see if any we don't get into any of everyone's questions. We'll maybe provide some answers offline as well. Um, so one of the things I saw in, in the chat was um, when you're managing invasive plants, what do you do with, uh, like, how do you dispose of them? Um, and that really depends on, on the plant. I'll just speak really quick on some of the mm -hmm. things. Like if you have a woody a woody uh, plant and uh, you see it in flower and you want to cut it down and just leave it there on site, that, that, that should be fine. Some plants do reroot. Um, if you're uh, managing Japanese uh, knotweed, for example, and, and, you, and you cut it, that, that those cuttings could reroot. But the important thing is trying to get it bef when it's flowering or before it flowers so it can at least cut off that year's seed production. I think that's very important for everyone to know. Um, also, if, you, if you're pulling up garlic mustard, for example, um, like in, it's, it's not fully seeded. Um, if it's fully seeded, you can put it in a bag, um, dispose of that, um, but you can also just break off the, the flowering head, rip out the plant, leave it somewhere in the sun for it to um, uh, die that way. But it really just depends on, on the plant you're managing. We have resources at SIPWIG and if anyone else wants to jump in quick on uh, any specific plant and how to dispose of it, feel free. I, yeah, I just, I have to say that that's a, that's a great question and that's something that um, more, more people should ask and talk about is how do I dispose of this plant afterwards or when do I dispose of it? Um, that's <laughs> how a lot of our plants are, um, are proliferated. Uh, these propagules, what do we do with this? Um, for instance, Japanese knotweed, again, like Emmett said, um, that can, if you, if you put that down on, on wet ground, that can root right back in there. Um, if you are managing invasives on your own property and you have an area that you can dispose of them, um, a brush or a, um, you know, a hot compost, something like that, that normally does a good job. Or if you can solarize, um, that does a great job. Um, try to limit as much garbage bags as possible, but um, yeah, if something's in seed, cut the seed head off and, and dispose of it that way. Definitely limit the production um, that you can for that season. But um, there's a lot of, you know, roadside work that gets done, that things are cut at the wrong time, um, or, you know, other propagules are brought from 
one place to the dump that then goes into um, your your you know compost that you free compost at the dump that you're bringing then that that you know uh, rootstock into your own property. That's how a lot of things travel. So definitely be mindful of if it's in seed at that time or if it spreads by rhizome or root. Um, but yeah, hot compost, solarizing. Um, if you have you know whatever you have on your property, that that works. Perfect. On, on on solarizing, is that a clear plastic or a black plastic? What's the best way to? Cook I've it? had I've had a lot of success with black plastic, um, but clear plastic I think uh, can do it depending on where you have it. I would say black plastic though um, tends to to do a better job. Great. Uh, question here. I think I can answer this one really quick. Um, so. Uh, there's some plants that are on the Connecticut invasive plant uh, list that are invasive, but they're not prohibited for sale. Um, so why is that? So one of the things, so uh, how plants get added to, to, to the statue is there's a group um, who actually manages this by, by, uh, by law. Um, so the, uh, um, how, how those plants get on there. So all the plants on that list are invasive. Some are not are not prohibited, meaning they can still be sold. So nurseries around Connecticut have actually done a fairly good job of, of um, even the ones like Japanese barberry is not prohibited, but there's a lot of cultivars out there that don't produce um, seeds or they're sterile. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, uh, they're there. So how that actually happens, um, it, there's a there's a lot more I can go into, but if if you do go to our website, uh, the Pla Invasive Plant Council does are the ones who makes the recommendations to the legislature, and they'll vote in order to prohibit a plant. Um, but um, so that's just kind of why it is. There are nursery interests for some of these plants. Um, for example, Barbara I mentioned, uh, burning bush can still be sold. I don't see an awful lot of burning bush still being sold. A lot of nurseries, a lot of nurseries are catching on. There's some great native plant nurseries around Fairfield County as well, but that's just kind of how it is there. A quick addition to that is, for, you know, that's that's great that you see that on the invasive plant list. Familiarize yourself with those plants. Um, mm -hmm. One way that you can you can really help is that when you're in the nursery and you're going to pick out a plant for your yard, Either try to focus on natives and what would be good in that, that spot, or you know you don't have to go 100% native. You can do a 70-30 thing. Um, but those non-natives that you're choosing, check to see if they're on the watch list. Google them beforehand. You know yeah. everyone has a smartphone. Um, see if you know even just you know uh, whatever plant it is, um, and then Google that plant and then invasive question mark. You, you should be able to get a lot of information that way. That's that's a good way of checking, you know, doing your part and checking to see if um, you're bringing something that's going to be problematic back home. Classic, sure. classic practical example, so, something you see so much of is Rose of Sharon. Just recently, I asked uh, all you guys, <laughs> you know, what do you think about that plant? Because uh, somebody had a couple of really nice Rose of Sharons, you'd pay, you know, 100 or two per plant. And uh, and they they wanted them removed and and uh, but there's no sense in proliferating that plant, right, guys? Yep. Yeah. So I mean, so that that criteria that we shared, that's how that goes to the criteria. So some of the plants, um, I know, I know, if I bring up bamboo, that's going to be a whole nother discussion that everyone here. But the reason why bam, one of the reasons why bamboo is not considered an invasive plant is just because it it doesn't spread. Um, it takes, I think, 70 or 100 years in order to produce seeds. It doesn't spread. It's not widespread. So basically, it clumps and it goes out from the clumps. I'm not saying it, it's not a it, it's, it's not a it's not a pain if it goes from your neighbor's yard to yours. But there are based on the Connecticut state statute, what is an invasive plant? So I think that's just important um, a differentiation here um, on what is and what isn't. And maybe there's some there's 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 definitely a lot of debate amongst I think folks here and also elsewhere what is an invasive plant versus is I'm just going by the state uh, statute there. Well, you know, it just... would be called a noxious weed, regardless of its <laughs> status as an invasive plant. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was looking for invasives in the woods in my own backyard recently, and I have a neighbor who's got some potted plants up on top of a rock, and I realized that their Chinese elephant ear had jumped out of the out of the pot and actually started growing on the hill. Uh, so that I think that you know that's how these things get around is is they they jump from a pot to another area and the next thing you know 
it's a new invasive. So I hope my neighbor's not listening, but I pulled it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, just to follow up on the disposal thing, I see uh, a recent uh, question. Is it okay to bring pulled invasives to the town's landscaping dump? It uh, depends on your town and what the, what what they allow. I mean, um, if your town allows brush, I mean, I don't think there's a few towns who are maybe thinking about doing uh, invasive uh, type piles and stuff like that. But just just kind of use common sense. Like, do you, are there seeds on the plant? If there's no seeds and it's not a plant, well, maybe can can um, uh, regrow just from a cutting, for example. Yeah, you can bring it to, to the town dump if your town allows that. Um, just that caveat, every town's different. There's no state law um, going through that. But also you can do it on site, like if, if, if that's, if, if you're able to. I think that's something that we all struggle with. Like, do you drag a bittersweet vine that has a bunch of seeds on it? Um, if you're cutting it down in winter and spread the seeds along along the, the, the uh, trail or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Just kind of use common sense, but there are some guides out there on the SIPWIG website and also online that kind of tells you what invasives you can how and how to dispose of them that way. Well, and also if anyone's had success, getting rid of an invasive, um, share that methodology with uh, SIPWIG and, you know, the rest of the rest of us, because we, you know, we, we learn from each other. For sure. Hey, um, hey, every, a, yep, go ahead. Just a quickie. You, often the advice on some of these invasives that propagate easily is incinerate them, you know, to mm -hmm. the dump with them uh, or bury them. Sometimes it says compost them, but we know composting can be an issue because composting is usually imperfect. It yeah. doesn't cook, kill the seeds adequately. So, the, the, and I know at our local uh, We Care Denali facility for composting, they do have signs out now that say, at least uh, please avoid putting bamboo in here. So what about compost? You know, compost is a, is a beautiful, powerful thing, but how do you, manage, for example, common sense would say, well, you could take your compost, you could put it in the sunshine and give it a little water and then see what comes out of it and then maybe kill it you know, or yeah. pull it and then use it. But is the solarizing going to uh, knock out the beneficial microbes? I mean, it's so, so composting, just, just a quick thing here. Uh, if you're going to compost invasives, try not to add anything with seed heads or has active seeds in there. Um, seeds are resilient. Uh, that's, that's how, that's how nature designs seeds. They, some survive fires, some actually need fire to grow. So, um, so if you can, you can if you can put uh, invasive plant material without seeds in there, monitor the pile, making sure nothing's growing out of it and turning it appropriate. I think that's the best. If you put seeds in it, there's, there's conflicting data out there on what temperatures kill certain uh, types of seeds. So yeah, Dan, that's an important question and something I guess I neglected. Uh, you don't want to put anything with seed heads on it that's invasive, um, and you don't want to anything that's going to be spreading by you know tuber or rhizome yeah. or rootstock. You don't want to be putting that rootstock in there either because that'll that'll root in there. Um, yeah. When I'm talking solarization, if you have an area on the property where you have specifically designated, not necessarily you're going to be using that soil anywhere, but that's an area to kill your plants, um, and then you cover that, and it's in it's in the heat, it's in the sun. Um, that would be any, I would say that would be the better spot to put those propagules. Um, and again, yeah, be very mindful about taking things off your property or how you're dragging them, or um, you know, because that's often again how things are spread. Um, wow, I just, that's. That's critical information for uh, land care professionals. For sure. Yeah, for hey. sure. Um, and I just see quickly in the comments here, is Miscanthus sinensis um, on the invasive list? Yes, it is on the invasive list. List. No, it is not on the ban list. Um, so that's another reason to be familiar with this invasive plant list. Um, that is one that is widely, widely available in the landscape trade right now. And you can go to just about any garden center that's you know, selling grasses and find this. Um, it's the most common yeah. beach grass. Um, I had yeah. found it popping up uh, in a lot of uh, open fields. I down, I mean, down south, it's very bad. It's all over the roadsides, all over hillsides. Um, so that's, again, something why you should be very uh, uh, familiar with these plant lists. Is there a common name for that? Um, silver grass. Hmm. Japanese silver grass is, is one. Okay. Great. It's a beautiful Another grass. question. It has beautiful plumes on it and everything, but it, it it's you know it, it can definitely jump out of your yards easily. 
For sure. Another question here. Can you give specific how to guidance on how and when to cut and paint uh, mature bittersweet vines? Yes. So uh, Emmett uh, had developed that awesome calendar that um, will be on the SIPWIC website. Um, and, you know, late summer into fall is a good time to do that. Um, yep. That's that's the time. A lot of the time when you're going to be painting, uh, that's the timing that you're going to be. There's certain exceptions like burning bush, wing geonimus, for instance, that uh, the SIPWIC calendar shows that you can do that, you know, pretty much throughout the winter. Um, but uh, it's it's yeah, late summer into fall would be the time when they're pulling all the resources down from, uh, from the plant into the roots uh, for the winter. For sure. And, and um, it's important to note to uh, always safety when using herbicides, uh, make sure um, there's, there's some what homeowners can buy, others professionals uh, need a license to use. So just make sure that you're up to date on all that and all the information can be found on the SIPWIC website and also uh, Connecticut um, DEP websites as well. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Japanese knotweed, a lot of people are commenting on Japanese knotweed, um, how to manage that. There's, there's a, definitely a few ways. And as someone, I think there's a talk on uh, managing Japanese knotweed that's going to be coming up soon, I saw as well. Um, so uh, both mechanical and chemical um, methods uh, can be effective. Um, as we mentioned, if you are using mechanical methods, you got to be careful on what you do with the uh, plant material because it can regrow. Um, and then uh, in terms of chemical methods um, late in the year, um, uh, spraying uh, seems to be fairly effective. A few different chemicals you can use what are found on the website um, as well. Anyone else have any experience with Japanese knotweed? I've had very good success spraying it uh, during its flowering period in the uh, usually around September or so. Yep. Uh, as long as um, it's in its flowering stage, I've used a couple different chemicals, glyphosate being one, uh, yep. amazapir being another, uh, very effectively. Um, had you know, seaside areas that were just totally covered and blocked and, and are now nearly free of it. Um, you know, there's always a few pieces here and there. We go back and keep whacking down, but you know, it seems like mechanical stuff, it's, it's you need a long time. <laughs> you yep, need a long yep, time to do it. Uh, but uh, if you really want to get rid of it, we've, we've had good luck with some spraying application. No, for sure. And, and, and that's what we hear. I mean, like, I'm not here to tell you uh, if it's your choice, if you want to use uh, chemical methods or mechanical methods, um, if you're a property manager, uh, whatever you feel is is best, but there are chemical methods. It does, there, there are some uh, ways that you can do it safely. Um, mechanical methods definitely can be effective for a lot of these invasive plants. The only caveat I would say is you just need to keep going back, checking the population, monitoring year after year. That's the same with chemical treatment too, but with mechanical treatment, uh, with mechanical means, if you're pulling, cutting, stuff like that, just keep going back to the site. It may take a little bit longer. And that's especially important with knotweed. Um, you, you think you're done with it and then all of a sudden <laughs> it'll just pop up again. Um, and then with, well, with knotweed, if you have it, so that's one of those plants that you want to find early. Once it gets established, it is going to be a pain in the butt. Um, Lou said he has great success with spraying in flower. Um, unfortunately, that's the time when a lot of pollinators are using it. Um, so you want to do your best. If you are going to be using chemical on that, um, I would cut it early in the season. So you stunt it and it flowers lower there's a chance of using less herbicide on smaller plants than larger plants. Um, and then maybe kick, try to kick off the pollinators or do it later in the day um, that, or, or, or early in the day. Um, yeah. You know, it, and pollinators love it. I mean, you walk up to oh, the that, Japanese yeah. knotweed <laughs> in full flower and you know, sometimes you can't hear yourself think because all the bees are on there. Um, so definitely sure. be mindful of that if you're gonna be using herbicides. No, 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 great point. Um, okay, here's a question about native plants. Um, what, uh, what are good uh, native plants that are maybe attractive that are good for recolonizing areas that maybe were previously occupied by garlic mustard, bittersweet, burning bush, wineberry? So just thinking of the environment where those plants go, it's usually um, maybe a little uh, side edges of forest, like edge habitat, maybe going into the forest a little bit. Um, so there's, there's definitely a, a few, especially when you think about um, burning bush. Burning bush is beautiful in the fall, but what else is beautiful? We have native blueberries as a nice red color 
um, there is a nice shrub. Hmm. Um, anyone else have any any thoughts on uh, kind of uh, natives to plant in kind of that habitat? Yeah, I, I start to think pioneer pioneer uh, plants as well. Um, you know, if you can afford to get you know a bunch of uh, tublings or plugs of like gray birch or something like that, um, that that would that would help uh, shade out that area in the future. Um, or even collecting some pokeweed um, seeds uh, from other areas of, of the property. A lot of people might not think of that plant as being a beneficial native. It is a great beneficial native and it helps um, uh, overpower certain invasive plants as well. Um, a lot of people actually think that plant is invasive, but it is, it's a great native plant and that has some phenomenal fall interest as well. Great. There's also um, a document in the resource uh, link that everyone got in their confirmation email, Alternatives for Invasive Ornamental Plant Species, yep. that talks about each of those plants and what some of the re recommended recommendations are. Highbush blueberry seems to show up quite a bit, um, but um, please take, take a look at that document in the link that everyone got in your email, um, and there's a lot of support material there. Perfect. Uh, just just touch base back on the knotweed. It's uh, Suzanne Thompson has a talk next month. Someone said in the in the chat um, who they're the ones who cut it three times. And um, I know they gave a talk at we had a talk on that on that. It's uh, one of our symposiums as well. And then a comment about uh, be careful using herbicides near water or wetlands. And yes, uh, for sure, there's uh, herbicides what are approved for around aquatics um, as well. But just always if if you don't know the answer. If you're not educated about using herbicides, make sure you get educated. I don't want anyone going out and and uh, after hearing the talk, oh, herbicides can work. Make sure you're educated. Make sure you read <laughs> read everything uh, be before you get into that. Um, yes, it can be effective, but there's lots of different ways to manage invasive plants. And consult okay. a professional if you if you, if yes, you don't know the for answer, sure. Um, definitely consult a professional. Um, that's a great point. A lot of the time, not weed is going to be growing with wet feet or around wet feet or areas of water. Uh, great point. Great point. Um, yeah, don't please just don't go out there and start spraying things to spray no. things. Um, research, ask people. Um, it takes a long time to, to get familiar with some of these uh, these methods. Yeah, for just the average homeowner, they can do a lot of what needs to be done without without result. You know, res resorting to using a lot of herbicide. Um, I tend to be doing very large areas, and it would be not really practical. Uh, time and labor wise to try and get it done without spraying some of the stuff. But uh, in a two acre house lot, it's a lot easier to just, you know, repeated mowing is not a big deal if you're only mowing, a, you know, a half an acre, you know, you can do that. Uh, but, you know, when you have, you know, a hundred acres and you're trying to get through it and the stuff is scattered here and there, it becomes much more difficult. So we look for something that we can get in once and get the major part of it done. And then we'll use things like pulling and flame weeding and and some other things as we go in and do the mop-ups afterwards. Um, so we're always looking for the least intrusive way to get the job done, but we do want to get the job done. Okay. There was a lot of talk about pokeweed and uh, somebody mentioned it's good to eat. I've always uh, told the guys, hey, you know, this is the cat birds love this stuff. Like, you know, let's leave one or two around because a lot of people think they're weeds and they should be gone when, when yeah. you leave. Uh, but then, there's that little bit about the berries being toxic to humans. <laughs> What's yeah, up with so that? It, it, in terms of eating invasives, there are some invasives you can't eat, um, but I, I'm not gonna be recommending anyone go out and start eating invasives um, just because there's a lot of lookalikes for some plants. Um, if, if, if you know there, there are some plants, yes, you can eat, um, but don't, don't I, I wouldn't recommend anyone going out there and just uh, making a lunch out of something well, maybe is not necessarily edible. So do your research before if you're going to do that. Yeah, and what, I just want to point, to, point out too, I did say, I did see in the chat that pokeweed is good to eat in the early spring. There are toxic parts of pokeweed. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, get, you, you really have to research that. You can't just eat all, the, whole, the whole part of the plant. Um, so please, please be very careful with that. And do your research. I'm not recommending, uh, like Emmett said, eating anything right now. Um, uh, what? What if you're a home, What if you're a homeowner and you have uh, children or pets? Is there really a significant risk that those berries are going to harm somebody? Do you know? 
as long as you educate your ch- children not to go and just eating stuff off, like eating berries off of plants, I think that's important. I don't think I, I've, I haven't heard of any dog poisonings or anything eating that. I don't think they, they necessarily go after that. Um, speaking of dogs, here's a question that I know we were talking about a little bit as well. Um, the association between Lyme disease and uh, barberry and, and why that is, there's a lot of white-footed mouth, m- mouse who go in kind of barberry patches, they transmit, um, they, they, they get a bit by a tick, they transmit Lyme disease, now the tick's crawling around, it gets in your dog. So one of the things, um, there's a lot of ticks around invasives, it seems like as well. So if you're walking your dogs, just be mindful of that. And that's kind of the reason, one of the, if, 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 if you're a big dog lover, one of the, maybe one of the reasons you want to manage your invasive plants is to maybe decrease your tick population um, there as well. Um, trying to see any other questions. Anyone on the panel have any questions that they want answered as I go through? I'll just take this opportunity to give a little Connecticut Audubon Society plug. Um, you know, as we were saying before, what can you do to help? Well, we also need resources. We need volunteers um, to help as well. Um, it's reciprocal. Um, with what we can do, we can also help the general public um, you know, learn about uh, some of these things and offer walks and talks and programs, et cetera. Um, so please, if you're not a member, you know, think about becoming a member. And um, also with the or- other organizations that we're working with, Ask the Duck Land Trust, Pollinate Pathway, um, you know, look into how you can help um, you know, become a, a, a member or um, you know, keep an eye on our calendars for upcoming events, certainly. Perfect. Um, okay, going back on the Q&A portion, there was a question early on. Uh, Renaculus, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily good with Latin. Uh, is a spring ephemeral, is it worth trying to eradicate? It's often along st- uh, stream banks. Um, does that mean only mechanical methods should be used? I'm seeing a big increase of the species and uh, properties I manage there. Um, so that's, I mean, we can folk definitely focus on this specific invasive, but I think that's that's something we all struggle with. Like there's a lot of invasives and where do we, where do you start? Um, and how big of an issue do you, we feel this invasive is? If depends on your property. I mean, if if all invasives um, will have the opportunity to outcompete natives, I think that's always the case. You should be managing invasives when you can. Um, but in terms of what you should be prioritizing, I think that's open for discussion. Any any thoughts here? Uh, yeah, I, w- one thing that I can say is definitely you know risk first reward kind of thing. Definitely think about it. Um, it, it, it there are um, certain uh, times where we have um, uh, areas around water, let's use for an example, that have a lot of invasives in them. If we remove those invasives, we're jeopardizing the integrity of that waterway. Um, they are serving a purpose at that point. Again, if you have no other plan of putting something in um, or um, you know, any other man-made uh, structure to put in there to support the edges of the water or hillsides, um, you know, they still are serving a purpose in that, that particular instance. Um, so just be mindful of that. You know, when you're pulling something out, what else is that going to cause to happen? Yep. Excellent point about water, uh, waterways. Isn't it true that the border vegetation around uh, a, a body of water is like one of the most productive ecosystems anywhere? Mm-hmm. And all too often people are stripping that out and, and we can really gain quite a bit. As you say, even if there's invasives along the edge of the waterway, it's, they're performing important habitat, filtering, runoff, slowdown functions. Um, so it's something good because people who are on waterways often try to engage folks like us to figure out what's the right thing to do to avoid damage. Yeah. One of the best things we can do is allow vegetation on the borders, I believe. Yeah, yeah. That's, no, a great, I, that's a great example of just that. We have in Troutbrook Valley, Hawley's Brook runs through the, the property there. And it's a, it's a class one native trout stream. There are trout there, five, six inches is a big one. Uh, and and uh, the, the stream pretty much dries up mostly in the summer. There's still some underground flow and there's a few pools here and there. And that's where the, the trout are actually over summering in, uh, you know, in these little pools. Um, 
And, and a good number of them are just overtaken by multiflora rose, which is shading and providing the cool temperatures that are required for these fish to survive the summer. So in our thoughts of, you know, getting rid of all the invasives, I, you know, I struggle with that as to what I can do. Uh, I am not going to take them away until I figure out what I could put there. And, and I may have to do it in little patches where we, you know, take out a patch and plant some larger shrubs and, and keep them. But uh, just the thermal regulation there that is provided by whatever is shading it. Yeah. And it happens to be multiflora rose, which has grown <laughs> up and almost covered the stream in these areas. Oh, that's geez. what's holding the population yeah. of the native trout. So, yeah. Um, and, and just reward. historically, some of these plants were brought over for certain reasons too. Um, <laughs> so multiflora rose and and uh, erosion, and there's uh, um, autumn olive, and it's nitrogen fix, fix, fixating. So that's why you can see it growing in gravel pits uh, sometimes too. So it's like it's it's just it's just a fun fact, kind of some where these invasives came from, and some were planted intentionally, um, uh, barberry as a barrier for, um, for um, farmers at one point too. Um, so looking at it, I think you can answer just maybe one or two more. I know we're at 1.30 now. Um, quick thing, uh, is milkweed bad for dogs? Just as an implant because I wanted to get a dog. So I mean, um, I would say uh, don't be feeding your dog milkweed, um, <laughs> but also uh, puppies. Puppies obviously are, are big at teething and they'll go after stuff. So if you can separate the dog from the plant, um, I think that'd be the safest option uh, if you can. But milkweed is a gorgeous plant. It supports a wide variety of, of insects and birds and more than just monarchs, even though monarchs are gorgeous. It, it was my gateway plant that got me into the whole native plant space. So and it's great for Perfect. kids too. <laughs> Um, All right, well, I, I think uh, we're coming up on the end of our time, guys. Yeah. Uh, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, anyone who answered, there's some very specific questions in there, so we'll review those uh, as a panel yep. and uh, get back to you by email if we have your email address with an answer. Again, I want to reiterate that there was a resource folder that you received when you got your confirmation email. Go in there and look at the resources that are there. Um, to help you identify native alternatives to invasives, et cetera. Um, I think this panel format was a huge success. I want to thank all of my panelists or all, all of our panelists for their contribution. Um, I think this is clearly a topic folks are very interested in. Um, all I can say to, to complete the, uh, the event is get out there and volunteer. All right, go help with the open spaces, look in your own backyard, support our uh, our pollinator partners and uh, the nurseries and the commercial firms that offer uh, invasive mitigation in your own backyard. Um, help us get this ecosystem larger so everybody's doing the right thing together. Um, so I think with that, Mary Ellen? Yeah, so thank you. That was great. Uh, so informative and, and we're just getting praise from the chat and Q&As here. Uh, and uh, yes, this again is recorded. Everyone who has registered will get uh, the recording of this. And um, just thank you so much for your interest and for our fabulous panelists. Uh, they were all excellent and uh, I just love this format. So thanks yeah. for coming up with it, Ted. And um, I just want to remind people, we do have a couple more Lunch and Learns coming up. April 13th is one called Nix the Knotweed. And Suzanne Thompson uh. of Connecticut will be uh, oh, talking about her technique to remove knotweed and other invasives. And April 8th, we have uh, Pam Roman, who's going to be talking about her backyard uh, journey of removing a, a heavily invaded backyard with from invasives to making a native uh, habitat. Um, it's two years. She did it during COVID, and it is a great story. So that's April 8th. So we definitely are on the April discussion about invasives. And the end of April, we have Jay Petro, who's gonna be speaking um, about transforming your lawn into a meadow. So everybody here, you know, if you're a member, you'll get this information. If you're not a member, join up. Join. And, uh, you can kind of jump <laughs> on and, uh, and, and uh, join us for these lunch and lunch. So um, again, everyone, I really appreciate it. it was a great, great uh, event. So thanks, Ted and panelists, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone.
Take Thanks, care. Man. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Take care.